Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. I'm Salvador Cordova, and it is a privilege, as always, to be with my friends and internet family. Tonight, I'm going to try to keep it as the variety show to less than two hours. One of the reasons I do these shows is it's also, it's really just a lot of fun. It's just a lot of fun to be able to share the topics that I've encountered um, throughout the day and what I've been thinking about. And it's just a chance to share with friends. And so it's, it's a delight to see you all in the chat that are joining us live. And uh, also a special thanks also to those who are joining us via recording. So I'm probably gonna just try to go right through the docket. So first topic is Heather Mercer. And who is she? Let me share a little article here and I'm going to put it in I'm going to put it in the uh, side chat the link to it it's what really got me started in intelligent design um, as far as outreach it was more of a kind of a private thing and just people ask me well what sort of prayers does God answer for you Sal and well, I was uh, struggling in my Christian faith, as you know, 20 years ago, I began studying intelligent design and I said, this is helping me. So if we look at the book of Acts, which would be a great study, it talks about Paul appealing to the unknown God. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm having a hard time just even believing you exist. Let's just start with what little I know. And we start. I started with intelligent design and then archaeology and creationism help identify that unknown God, as it, Paul refers to it in Acts 17, as the Christian God. And so I said, you know, I really, I want to tell everybody about my renewed faith. And so I started a little club at George Mason University as an alumni and continuing study student with another student there in 2004. And it was just the two of us and we we're filling out the paperwork that we were about to submit to get official university recognition. And I don't know as um, I said, hey, Christy, let's, let's just pray for this. Um, I think this is too important not to pray about. And so there we were in the student cafeteria and we prayed. Now, as we were praying, it came upon my heart. I don't know whether I said it verbally or not, but it was on my mind as we prayed. I said, Lord, can what we do here get national attention? I don't want our work here to be forgotten. So just think, 2004, I'm there with another student. And it's just the two of us starting this little group. And it was only just the two of us. And that was somewhere probably in the fall of 2004. And then 2005, we finally have our first, our first intelligent design meeting. So maybe it was the fall of 2004, maybe a little later. I don't, I actually don't remember. You know, it was probably the fall of 2004. And we actually didn't get around to being organized enough to have our first meeting. Uh, at George Mason University. But when I prayed that prayer, only three months later, I get this email from Casey Luskin, who was not yet at the Discovery Institute. He was with the Idea Center and he was a law student. And he said, Salvador, a reporter from Nature wants to contact you. He wants to have a conversation with you. I was like, what's that about? And I ended up being on the cover story of the most prestigious scientific journal in the world, in history probably. I got national attention. I ended up being on television shows, uh, the Coral Ridge Hour, national TV. Uh, Christy was on national public radio. Carolyn Crocker, who came to our first meeting, ended up being in the motion picture expelled. So I'd say God answered that prayer. And so I linked to that article. 
And I'm going to share a little bit of that article because I indirectly mentioned Heather Mercer and the influence of her being of her life on my journey to intelligent design. Now, I don't know Heather personally. McLean Bible Church is a gigantic church. We never met in person, but she was a part of that church and also a dual member in other congregation. So I'm going to read. Um, uh, I'll. I'll I'll read a little bit from the Nature article first. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit from the Nature article first. I don't know how I'm getting this. Uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll Sorry, that was a technical glitch. I had, I actually had a browser window open. That's where you're getting this funny echo. So that's on me. I didn't, I didn't get my, to use an aviator term, I didn't get my switchology correct. So let me share this article. And so that reporter from Nature then invited me to have coffee. So let me, let me know. So he actually describes our conversation. Let's see if I could see it here. Okay, so this is from the journal Nature, and there was there was me in 2005. It just begins, let me see if I can get this a little clearer. For a cold Tuesday night in March, the turnout is surprisingly good. 20 or so fresh-faced college students are gathered together in a room in the student union at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, the state's largest public university. They are there for the first meeting of Salvador Cordova's Intelligent Design and Evolution Awareness Club. And uh, I have a great deal of respect for the scientific method. Cordova tells his attentive audience as he outlines the case for intelligent design. Broadly speaking, he says, the concept is that a divine hand has shaped the course of evolution. The arguments are familiar ones to both advocates and opponents of the idea. Some biological systems are too complex, periodic explosions in the fossil record too large, and difference between species too great to be explained by natural selection alone. Cordova, who holds three degrees from the university, the most recent one in mathematics, argues that the development of life on Earth would be described better if an intelligent creator is added to the mix. Now, just a little bit of a, a note here. At the time, I was not a full-blown young Earth creationist. I was halfway between old Earth creationist and young Earth creationist, but I was very much more involved in the intelligent design movement at that time. And it says I had three degrees, that is correct. But I went on to, to study and later in that article will describe that I, I intended to go to grad school. So then I'll, we'll just continue here. Let's see, I'm trying to find the part about, this one, this article also had Stephen Myers, Bruce Alberts, uh, a bunch of people, Eugenie Scott. So, the, the, there are people that might start from say a religious perspective and 
I think that's, it's, it's been a while since I've read that article. And then I came from, I don't know what it says. It's been a while since I've read this, what it's saying about in the opposite directions. So I'll just read it. Others, including Cordova himself, arrived at intelligent design from almost the opposite direction. Over a coffee or earlier that day, that is me and the reporter, Jeff Brumfield, over a coffee earlier that day, he explains how intelligent design helped him resolve his own spiritual crisis five years ago. Since high school, Cordova had been a devout Christian, but as he studied science and engineering at George Mason, he found his faith was being eroded. The critical thinking and precision of science began to really affect my ability to just believe something without any tangible evidence. And some of my critics mocked me for that. And it's like, well, well yeah, you should not believe something without any tangible evidence. And, and that's what I was, I think the critics were right to, 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 to mock me for that because um, I felt I was, you know, being um, led by the nose and not being told why I, I should believe something. It was the church culture. And God bless these these people. They meant, they really meant well. But it, it really didn't, it didn't inspire me to believe. And, and so, uh, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to just start from square one and just, uh, uh, try to find God with what little I have. Uh, <laughs> oh, if you want a real interview, bring uh, bring a nice bourbon and at least two cigars. <laughs> Thank you. So, oh yes, Matson. Thank you for uh, taking a look at that article about with Keith Miller. So the, uh, now I'll just continue. So yeah, I, I, it nearly eroded my faith. I said, I want evidence, he says. The breaking point came in 2000 when a woman from his Bible study group put her faith before her personal safety, traveling to Afghanistan as part of a covert Christian mission in a country that was at the time a militant Islamic theocracy. He felt unhappy accepting the promotion of such activities unless he could be sure Christianity Christianity was the true faith. All right, so there's a little bit of, um, I think, accidental misreporting here. I think Jeff tried his best, and he captured most of the sense of this. There are actually two girls. One of them was a member of my Bible study. She was the pastor's daughter of the church I attended and I led that Bible study and she was going to a, an Islamic country. Uh, to this day, I, it's so such a sensitive issue. I don't know that location is like big secret because she's constantly in danger. And then there was Heather Mercer. So there are actually two. So that part of the article, it's an understandable that he conflated the two. I'm, I probably misstated it. So let's just assume that the confusion in the reporting of this was totally on me. So I'm, I'm going to grant him that. Now, the, the, the one and a half, this thing really did trouble me. I was thinking, oh boy, Sal, you know, you don't have hardly any evidence that this is true. Um, yeah. I, I had mentioned that I'd seen a vision many years earlier, but you, you just wonder, is this a hallucination? I mean, I was just really conflicted. I was like, you know, if God's such a big God, why isn't he so obvious? He should be as obvious as the sun we see every day. And I, I was getting very frustrated. And uh, God didn't heal my dad after I prayed and prayed and prayed. So, uh, so, so, Heather Mercer, in in two thousand in the uh, in two thousands, she was. Uh, I kept seeing this prayer request for Heather Mercer because uh, I was also a part of McLean Bible, a group there, and uh, I, I was circulating a letter 
a prayer for my dad <clears throat> before he died. And so this prayer list would circulate and Heather Mercer's name would always come up. And I was really upset. I said, you know, I, I said, why would these young ladies just throw their life away for people that don't want to hear the gospel, for cultures that don't want to hear the gospel? I'm not saying that I had the right attitude. It's probably the wrong attitude, okay? But I was just, you know, I just like if these, if the Muslim culture doesn't want you, just shake off the dust from your sandals and move on. But that really wasn't the right attitude on my part because there are a lot of people in that culture that if they heard the gospel, they'd probably seek after it. And that's what happened. So let me read a little bit about Heather Mercer. Heather Mercer, born in 1976, is an American who was one of the 24 aid workers arrested in August 2001 by the Taliban in Afghanistan in connection with their with uh, uh, with their work with the Germany-based Christian organization aid organization Shelter Now International. She, along with seven other Western aid workers and their 16 Afghan co-workers, was arrested on August 3rd, 2001 and put on trial for violating the Taliban prohibition against proselytism. She was held captive in Kabul until anti-Taliban forces freed her in November 2001. She co-authored a book with her fellow captive, Dana Curry, published in 2002, entitled Prisoners of Hope, the story of our captivity and freedom in Afghanistan. Okay, so during her captivity, she met Gen British journalist Devon Ridley, who was arrested near the Pakistan border and brought the same to the same prison in Kabul. Yvonne Ridley informed her about September 11th and the subsequent military actions against the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. On November 15th, the women, along with six other imprisoned workers, were freed from the prison by anti-Taliban forces flown and flown to safety in Islamabad, Pakistan. I seem to recall they were freed by the army rangers. So that was a big answer to prayer. And, and uh, I just want to uh, say a few things about this. I, as I said, I, I do occasionally see what other people say on other channels about things I say and almost a testable prediction they're gonna mischaracterize, give the most uncharitable interpretation of what I have to say. Uh, straw man the argument. I heard an, I heard them say that um, I we prayed that Heather Mercer would be rescued and that I was saying that God caused the 9-11 terrorist attacks to rescue Heather Mercer. That is the most uncharitable characterization of my comments. So in case I didn't communicate this well, my point is that God can use a bad circumstance to work something good out. I am not, I'm absolutely not saying that I prayed, that we prayed, and therefore there was the September 11th terror attack. But of course, people that, want to attack what I have to say will not give me a charitable reading. They'll put the worst possible spin in misrepresentation. And for, for reasons like that, um, the guy who runs the channel, I blocked him. I said, I'm just fed up with this. This is not, it's not gonna be healthy for me to be he hearing, listening, watching two hours, two hour long shows about me twice a week, just, misrepresenting what I have to say, not accurately reporting it, mischaracterizing it and pretending that, you know, just giving straw mans and trying to say self it has a tortured mind. I just, it's just not worth it. So I, that's part of the reason I specifically wanted to mention Heather Mercer today. But God can work all things for the good of those who love him. And he was able to take a bad circumstances like the 9-11 terror attacks and then 
the Americans invaded Afghanistan and liberated um, Heather Mercer. So God can't turn a bad situation for the good. And so, but the point was, I was really conflicted. I said, you know, it's one thing to believe in Christianity for yourself, but what if I'm promoting Christianity and I'm sending pe people to their death? Um, I was thinking, well, why don't these young ladies just try to live happily ever after here if Christianity's not the real deal? And I said, so it's not just for myself that I want to know Christianity is true. I want to know if it's true so that I can be assured that if I encourage other people to be Christians, that I'm not misleading them to something that'll be bad for them. And, and, and so that's, those are the things, as, as it was accurately reported by Jeff Brumfield, that was the breaking point. Yes, that was that was beginning to be the breaking point. I said, you know, it's, it's bad enough if I'm pursuing something that's not true. But then to add to it, then to mislead others. And I, I said, I have to just do a little time out and try to sort this out. And so I, I read 1 Corinthians yesterday. Uh, if the dead are not raised, if Christ is not raised, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And so intelligent design was the beginning of my search uh, back to healing. So with that, now we'll just go to the next topic on the docket. Let me see the... Greetings to Raman and Patrick and Matt. Dan Strait. Hey, it's great to see you. It's been a while. And Honesty Angel. This is great. So what's next? on? The, oh, my goodness. Next on the docket is Paula Broadwell. Whoa. Okay. This is going to be. All right, so if I could explain, oh, someone was saying no downvotes yet, it's a miracle. L let me explain what I suspect. Someone has a real grudge against me and had a lot of sock accounts because if you look at yesterday's broadcast, it was up to 16 downvotes. Somehow that got amended to two. That means the YouTube bots were able to figure out that this is probably one guy with several accounts, 15 accounts. And it just um, consolidated all his 15 downvotes into one. So I only got two downvotes. Maybe uh, this individual learned his lesson that that's not going to work. And he's just wasting his time. So, um, but I did get a lot of extra views uh, temporarily. So that was kind of cool. So the next one is the topic of adultery, which is actually going to lead to a topic of uh, someone's redemption, Rosaria Butterfield. She was a lesbian. And I do want to address these topics a little bit um, because it addresses it in the Bible. And uh, here in Loudoun County, and Dr. Sandy Pigeon mentioned it yesterday, there was a, there was a rancorous school board meeting. And uh, he showed me a video. Of one of the women was talking about you know, I, I don't like something about she didn't like all the Christians there in the room who are, who are just spewing all this hate. And then they had to, they had to cut the meeting and then someone got arrested. It was a rancor. It, it was, it was a very contentious meeting. And so I'm going to try to address why, um, why it is that Christians are called to do certain things that'll um, be upsetting to others. I might not have the best explanation except to say that it's ultimately what God requires. And that's enough. The hard part is fighting our own emotions. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, I'm not too far from, uh, um, I'm actually, you know, I, I'm in Prince William County and I'm just south of Fairfax County. I was raised in Fairfax County. Um, 
it, I laugh because they say it's the richest county in the United States. I'm just like, why does everyone feel so poor? Is because the real estate prices are so high. <laughs> You have to earn a lot just to live there, but then you you know you're just squeaking by half the time. Um, so you don't. No one there, hardly anyone there, really feels rich unless you live in um, a certain part of town called um, certain side of McLean, Virginia, which is in Fairfax County. And then Loudoun County has places like Ashburn, and it is there. The real estate is more affordable, and you get a lot of bang for your buck and people live in just gigantic mansions there. So, uh, so, um, so let me read some scriptures here. Um, so I'm going to introduce this topic regarding general David Petraeus, general Petraeus. And, I'm not going to put this in view mode because sometimes it'll kill my stream. So you have to, if you'll forgive me, I'm just going to do this in my edit mode for PowerPoint. So let's introduce this topic. Academics use Petraeus to show that men forgive affairs if mistress more attractive than wife. All right. I, I, you know, this is such a touchy subject. I like, I don't know how to, to deal with it. So I'm going to use a little bit of humor. Okay. Five university professors conducted a study into infidelity by asking students whether they felt more forgiving of retired General Petraeus conducting an affair after seeing photos of his wife, Holly, and his quote-unquote more attractive and much younger mistress, Paula Broadwell. Three psychologists and two criminologists from the Midwest are to publish their conclusions in a paper entitled Sex Differences in Cognitive and Moral Appraisals of Infidelity. Evidence from an experimental survey of reactions to the Petraeus affair. Uh, Gilherme Lopez, Andrew Holub, and Todd Shackelford of Oakland University, Michigan. Juca Savolinen of University of Michigan and Joseph Swartz of the University of Nebraska found that men were more likely to show understanding of infidelity by Petraeus when they saw photos of his wife and mistress. Okay, some may, may be wondering, so what are you doing? What are you covering these topics on this channel? Um, it, it's partly because I try to dilute things a little bit from being just all nerd, okay? And, um, uh, you know, it's just like if you, if you took coffee without any water, just dried coffee and sugar, it'd be a little bit too much. So it's just a little bit of levity, but then I'm actually going to, it's going to connect to some things in biology and just some things to think about. They concluded these results suggest sex differences in appraisals of infidelity, which are particularly salient when participants are presented with visual stimuli, contrasting the wife and the more attractive mistress of the unfaithful man. Elaborating on the gender differences, they explained, as predicted, Men, more than women, reported lower scores of moral appraisal, that is condemnation, and higher sc scores of cognitive appraisal, understanding across both conditions. Okay, translation is that they found that uh, men, when they saw pictures of the wife of Petraeus versus the mistress, were not condemning of him as much as the women and it's like uh duh but um it was good that they I, I still feel it was good that they did their study just to be rigorous so let's okay i'm going to show you their pictures okay so here is 
General Petraeus. There's the man. And this is Mrs. Petraeus here. Now I'll show you. <clears throat> so how did he get in an, into an affair with another woman? Well, this woman named Paula Broadwell, by the way, Paula Broadwell's married. So is Petraeus. Okay. So Paula Broadwell is married and she met General Petraeus at some defense intelligence meeting and said she's writing a book on General Petraeus and or, or, or a thesis or something and she wanted to interview and they got to meet eventually they she started writing a book and there she is uh, the mistress and the book she wrote was uh, Paula Broad by Paula Broadwell all in the education of General David Petraeus the education of General David Petraeus and uh, there's another picture of Ms. Broadwell. <laughs> and okay, so this was, um, th they presented these photographs to men in the uh, study on men's reactions to uh, other men's infidelity. And they said, well, men, when they saw these photographs, were much more forgiving and understanding than the Then the women, so the women were not happy. Okay. That says in Proverbs, do not desire her beauty in your heart and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. And so when I, <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, I think you understand. Now this is actually General Petraeus and his wife when they were still courting at West Point. And so that is, the future husband and wife, uh, General David Petraeus and Holly Petraeus. And it says in Proverbs, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Proverbs 5.18. And it says here, he who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor and his disgrace will not be wiped away. So how did this play out for General Petraeus? Everyone, it, it was all in the tabloids. It was all in the tabloids and um, his reputation was trashed. All his fabulous military career was compromised because he cheated. Um, so it's like, yeah, why'd you do it? And I'm going to cover some culture things that will maybe try to touch upon this and also, uh, d d you know, kind of the biological wiring. And this actually does eventually tie to other sinful activities like homosexuality, transgenderism. Because I wanted to say heterosexuals, straight guys, straight women, are not immune to problems of a biological imperative. It just happens to be that uh, if you happen to be General Petraeus and you're married, you're gonna hurt someone in the process if you have an affair. Um, and you know, maybe he tried to keep it secret from her. And, and good on him for that if he tried not to hurt his wife bad on him for cheating uh, but um anyway he who commits adultery lacks sense he does it um destroys himself he will get wounds and dishonor and his disgrace will not be wiped out wiped away and that's still the case an illustrious military career down the drain because of his mistress and uh, I'll just just to uh, show his mistress again, there she is. And it says in the Bible, do not desire her beauty in your heart and do not let, let her capture you with her eyelashes. So some things never change and if the Bible says, don't do it, 
We usually find that when the Bible gives a command not to do something, that's usually something you really want to do. I mean, to just be straight about it. <laughs> you know, if God said chase after everything you really desire, that'd be pretty easy to follow. Usually God will give you a command for something that doesn't please him, but something that, humanly speaking, you're going to desire pretty badly. And, and okay, so, so I, I am kind of like, you know, I know some people are thinking, yeah, thank you, Captain Obvious. Yeah, that, that's r rather obvious. So um, let me just continue here. Yeah, so that was the younger Petraeus with his wife. And um, that was the, the couple later on. And uh, by the way, thank you for your service. And as I was thinking of this whole Petraeus affair, it said, lead us not into temptation. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, you know, there's so many things we could be. So many things we could be tempted into. Just help us. Help us. And as I said last night, you know, as far as I'm not into, I'm not into getting my nose in other people's personal affairs. That's between, you know, as long as it doesn't affect me, it's not my place to try to be the agent of God's wrath on their sin. That's for God to do. Jesus said, let him who has no sin cast the first stone. So the way it is in the New Testament is 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 different with under the new covenant. And then also Jesus is pointing out, you know, let him who has no sin cast the first stone. And so I got pretty upset when I heard yesterday people were, you know, saying I'm going to go out and start to try to interfere with people's lives that are committing these sins. That is so untrue. They're accountable to God on Judgment Day. I will just say, God is not approving of this. But, <clears throat> moving on. So we have sources of temptation. It says, And you hath been quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein time past ye walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So we'll hear the phrase sometimes, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So you have it here, um, the word world. Let's see if I can highlight it. world. And the prince of the power of the air. So the world, and then it talks about the lusts of the flesh. So when they say the world, the flesh, and the devil, uh, it's right there in that passage. So it's usually summarized, and I was wondering if it actually said it specifically in that uh compactly in in the bible and it, it it is in ephesians but it's not quite you know when people say the world the flesh and the devil um you could say that it's from there what what um grabbed me about that is the flesh and this is going to lead to homosexual you know the questions of homosexuality and transgenderism etc cetera, etc cetera. but Let's just cover some other things. One of the, the favorite American classics is Casablanca. And this is, this is actually, uh, okay, so the story is Humphrey Bogart plays someone by name Rick, and Ingrid Bergman is playing someone named Ilsa. It's, so that's Rick and Ilsa. Ilsa is, um, this is during World War II, and her husband was taken away to a concentration camp and she was told that he died and he didn't. So she was still married and didn't know it. And then she, uh, Ilsa and Rick meet in Paris just before 
uh, the Nazis come and invade it, they fall in love and uh, they're going to get married. And they had a policy like no questions asked. They didn't want to find out because Rick was saying, how did I get so lucky? To, you know, you're single. She said, let's not have questions. And so they're going to flee Paris and live happily ever after somewhere else. And he gets a letter from her saying, I can't, I can't see you. God bless you. <laughs> okay. So this drama develops and they meet and they have this chance meeting in Casablanca and there's drama there as to what they're, they're going to do. So this ended up at the time, it was the number one movie. And a lot of people could identify with the idea that this is a forbidden love and what are they going to do? And, they do the right thing in the end. And so there's some great lines there like uh, play it, Sam. And uh, here's looking at you kid. And um, when he's saying goodbye to uh, Ilsa, he says, uh, he said, we'll always have Paris. And um, she goes, she flies off with her husband and does the right thing. So this is a, a love affair. And uh, yeah, it has a tinge of adultery in it but probably a lot more innocent than some of the others. The one that is famous in American culture was Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, now this is, uh, <laughs> Casablanca was fictitious. Nathaniel Hawthorne is fictitious, but there's some things, aspects of this that uh, I checked the history. Uh, in the Puritan cultures, if you were caught in adultery, you would have to wear an embroidered thing to identify you as an adulterer. And so you had to wear your shame <clears throat> for, I don't know, for a prescribed time or some sort of punishment. And I did point out that at one time they even suggested the death penalty for this. And I'm just like, you know, this is not what the New Testament teaches. It's not what the New Testament teaches. But when I was in high school, this story I found very compelling on a number of levels. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and they had a movie there that, um, so we were just like these sophomores in high school, and the English teacher is trying to teach us this book. It was, it was assigned reading. And I actually thought this was the better, the best novel I ever got assigned by an English teacher ever, because I went off to college and it was some pretty ugly. All, all, all the stories are just horrible. This one had at least a little bit. It, it just kind of hit your heart in a way. And then they had a movie about it. They had a movie that dramatized it with Meg Foster. And so that put a different twist on this. And now looking back, I could see kind of the reactions among the other students, even the girl students. The sentiment was that she should leave her husband. I mean, I could just feel it in, in the room. It, it, there was a part of me, it's like, yeah, she should leave her husband. So, so the movie did a very powerful job of saying, okay, you have someone, this was from a later version of Scarlet Letter. There are several movies by this name. And, they made her husband, so she was like a 16-year-old girl that uh, was into like some sort of forced marriage. You know, it was all money related to some old man. And this was this was her husband. So they made the guy look really, really creepy in the movie. And he acted creepy. And they, they referred to him as the fiend. The fiend. Now I did I didn't have a good picture. So then she um, she falls in love with this pastor this preacher. So, so this is making it even more dramatic. So you have this girl and she finds a man of God and she has a baby with him, but he's a man of God. And this made it really all the more compelling. Um, now this is just a few months after I became a Christian. So I did not, you know, there's a lot I did not understand in this, but you know, all I could see is you had, you had this kind of fiend for a husband and you had this beautiful young girl and comes along this handsome preacher. Now, I didn't have good clips of the, the guys in the um, various versions of the movie, 
But I want to show you, I don't know, I just Googled handsome priest or handsome reverend. And of course, reporters would find it. So here are some handsome, handsome priests. So you can imagine this, this is the, uh, the guy that Hester Prynne, uh, by the way, so I'll, I'll give the name. So this is, that's the husband, the fiendish husband. And this is Hester Prynne. And they're in a Puritan colony. And so these handsome priests, I'd say, are like, you can imagine them, Arthur Dimsdale. Arthur Dimsdale is the, um, you can pick, okay. <laughs> Some reporters found these handsome priests here. So just imagine there, now you have Arthur Dimsdale being the handsome priest. And of course, I would presume, so this is being presented to the teenagers and sophomore, sophomore, high school, sophomore English class. And, and they're like, yeah, go for the, go for the preacher. <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't laugh. But Nathaniel Hawthorne was very, very clever in setting up this situation. And I, I'm going to try to relate this to scripture in also resisting temptation because there are a lot of biological imperatives going on in this and also in the Petraeus affair. And, uh, um, and, and so l let me just continue. So anyway, that was Nathaniel Hawthorne's thing. And, and it raised a lot of questions because everyone wanted, I could, you could just sense everyone wanted Hester Prynne. They wanted Hester Prynne to dump her creepy husband. So Hester Prynne would dump her creepy husband and live happily ever after with a man of God, and they raised their baby out in the wilderness. And there's some very touching scenes there, and also very touching dialogue. Now, a real life story, and I mentioned F. Scott Fitzgerald. His uh, this was from this is the movie Beloved Infidel, but it's based on a true story of F. Scott Fitzgerald. His his wife um, went insane, had a um, really terrible bout, I guess, of schizophrenia. And this, then he was working, he had to, he's trying to support her. And so he left the East Coast, went to Hollywood and got income there. And he, he met someone there and uh, named Sheila Graham. And that was, that was the love of his life toward the end of his life. And I was just like, Lord, you know, this is, it's, 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 you know, there, this is a real tragedy, one that his wife would go insane. And I, you know, it was wrong what he did. But um, you know, someone comes along when your your life's a mess and, you know, your wife's in an insane asylum. I can get that. So what does the Bible tell us what to do? And now I'm going to read a really politically incorrect verse here. but. I, it doesn't matter. It's it's what God tells us to do. And so this is why you don't. If you're a man, you be faithful and you do some other things for your wife in addition to that. It says here, likewise, husbands, love your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as, as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, I said this is politically incorrect because it's referring to the woman as treating her as the weaker vessel. It doesn't mean that she is. So in my case, when my dad died, when he was terminally ill, for sure the, my mom was the stronger vessel. Because, you know, dad could not, uh, this happens a lot where uh, when someone's about, you know, about to be widowed, she will be the stronger of the two physically, often the more capable. And so some people have interpreted this verse to say, you know, uh, just like a uh, something that's very precious, many things that are precious are more fragile. And it doesn't mean that she is, but you have to treat her as 
as something precious. Treat her as something precious. And I know my sisters are going through this themselves. They are the stronger vessel in that their husbands are very, very, very sick. I, I, I went to Memphis recently to visit my brother-in-law and, you know, I, we don't know how long he has to go. And it's a tough conversation to, to, to have with your sister. It's like, you know, you're talking about living 20 years like mom did without her husband. And so um, yet, even with that, I could tell that their husbands are treating them as the honored vessel, as the vessel that is precious and fragile, even though they're the ones really that are falling apart. But it's beautiful to see them exercising the Christian principle here, even though they are the weaker vessel at this time, they are still treating their wives as the weaker vessel. So that's about all I have to say as far as the political incorrectness. So what's the point of all this? We have all these strong biological imperatives. Um, <laughs> Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I mean, uh, you see this in the animal kingdom where uh, you had the, like the seals and walruses, they'll fight, the males will fight and sometimes kill each other, I think. Anyway, what ends up happening is that one male will then get a lot of the girls and the other males are just set aside. The, the, the females will not be driven. And so uh, in the Bible, you have situations where there's one man married to many women. And I was always wondering, why did, Lord, did you permit that? And that wasn't the original plan from Genesis. But one thing that I did realize, and Jordan Peterson pointed out, in violent cultures, that's when you have this kind of polygamy. And it's because there's just a shortage of males. And um, I kind of knew it. I kind of realized, you know, some of those women, they needed to have children so that they would have children to take care of them when they were older. And I, I, I personally see the importance of that. So God, I, you know, it doesn't explain why in the Old Testament that I'm presuming, I'm just assuming, I'm just, or say speculating, that God gave that generous permission, partly as compassion to these women that wouldn't otherwise have anyone to uh, father their children. They, they, they would die alone. And because um, in these violent cultures, the, the men are just killing each other. So if there's an excess of females, that's that was to help them. That's purely speculation on my part. Um, but as far as, you know, not caving in to things that you really desire, that's part of your biological imperative. Okay, so why do older men like younger women? If you think about it, if there were not that biological imperative, it, it wouldn't be reproductively successful for the population. So that drive is very strong that um, women in their childbearing years are the most attractive to males. It just makes sense. And, and then also uh, because men have a, I, I believe, you can check this, have a higher mortality rate um, from various things. They tend to get in more trouble, tend to get killed faster. Um, just the fact that uh, a man might be older is, it's like that's an indicator, oh, you know, there's survival advantage in that one, in that prospect. So you do see where you have the older men and, and the younger women. And, and, and so you could see that dynamic with General Petraeus. And even in that movie Casablanca that I showed earlier, um, Humphrey Bogart was like 15 to 17 years older than Ingrid Bergman. But the American culture didn't look at that too resentfully at the time. The age gap was even more in the movie High Noon with Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly, who was 19 and he was like 40 or something. Again, the American culture didn't at that time look on that disfavorably. They might have something to say now. Um, but so those imperatives are very strong. So it's understandable. David Petraeus, when he's much older, um, 
is really liking Paula Broadwell. But it doesn't make it right. Now, the situation is if you really love God and he's the most important thing in your life, then this will be something you can deal with. But if your life doesn't have the Lord, I wouldn't know, you know, I can't logically say what's right or wrong, because as I said, there are no answers in atheism. Atheism doesn't give you an, ex, um, an explanation of how to resolve these issues, because there's no answers in atheism. But in Christianity, our relationship with God is the most important thing, and you're called to sacrifice something you desire very, very strongly. That's part of bearing the Christian cross. You sacrifice something you really want and desire. So yes, it's a sinful desire, and it may have it has strong biological origins, and you may not be able to to run away with it. You might have to deal with that. And so, when these people say, "Oh, you're trying to keep these homosexuals apart from each other, and they love each other," it's like you know, if there's no God, then I can. I, you know, if, if those people believe that there's no God, I could see how they would look at it that way. Just pursue what you really desire. It's just between you and that other person. But if there's a God in the world who says, no, I don't like that, then you have to follow it. And that's that's what's going on in our culture. We, we, we have to... Um, you know, the Christians are saying, oh, you want to break these ha people up and deny them of their happiness. It's like, well, on some level, I'm assuming it might, they might be a little, ha they might be happier together for a short time. But to die in your sins, you're not going to be happy forever. It's only in this life. And that's also God's, you know, that's, God is telling us, through his word that this life and all its desires are not the ultimate thing. And when Jesus said it's a cross to bear, it is. It really is for some, absolutely it's a cross to bear. A cross is not a pleasant thing. Bearing a cross is not a pleasant thing. And so um, Jesus said, pray always that you'll have strength and be able to stand before the Son of Man. And it just kind of made me tremble and think, I'm like, Lord, all the things I could get into uh, that displease you, <laughs> give me the strength so that I could stand before you on the final day. Give me the strength that I could stand before you on the final day. Some people have way more, temp you know, some people are in way more difficult situations than I can ever imagine. And like um, the case of F. Scott Fitzgerald, and just like, I can't imagine having a spouse that's in a mental institution or someone that has substance abuse problems or any sort of other problems. It's like, well, you know, <laughs> these things were just so out of my control. And, you know, someone else comes along and, and can do everything that that spouse could not. You know, they can talk to you, spend time with you. And you're not having to fight with the substance abuse issues that that spouse is bringing into the marriage, or if they have, God forbid, mental issues. So, you know, I just want to say, you know, I, I have empathy in that sense for what these people. I have friends going through stuff like this, and I, I have, I have real empathy and um, on the other hand the empathy the best thing is if you're a Christian is to, to please God to bear your cross and these are hard words for me to say because like one thing I you know I don't like talking about certain topics because then it makes me feel kind of accountable too and it's like yeah man tough uh, it's it's a tough road so I just wanted to say, you know, I don't think the Bible condemns us having, temp 
having feelings, it acknowledges. It's acting on the feelings that is really condemned. But temptations are inevitable. They're the world, the flesh, and the devil from Ephesians, from that passage in Ephesians. So how does that relate to my next topic? And let me um, bring that up, <clears throat> which is homosexuality. So what happens when there is same-sex attraction and how is it dealt with? And the best resource I could come up with was the account of Rosaria Butterfield. Oh, here it is. And I'll just read it because this is beautiful Christian testimony. Now, I've been told, I've been told, and also from the things I've read, it's, it's easier for a, a homosexual woman to turn straight. It's much, much harder for a homosexual man. So just take that for what it is. Okay, so I, I, I've talked to some, I asked a gay man once, is, is, is that true? He said, oh yeah. And he, he said, I can give you the details, but it's kind of graphic. I said, don't. Okay, I don't want to hear. But um, just, um, so that's just a little data point. So I'm going to share my, uh, my screen here. And this is the story of Rosaria Butterfield from Christianity Today. And it is my train, my train wreck conversion. As a leftist lesbian professor, I despised Christians. Then I somehow became one. Rosaria Champagne Butterfield, February 7, 2013. The word Jesus stuck in my throat like an elephant tusk. No matter how hard I choked, I couldn't hack it out. Those who professed the name commanded my pity and wrath. As a university professor, I tired of students who seemed to believe that knowing Jesus meant knowing little else. Christians in particular were bad readers, always seizing opportunities to insert a Bible verse into a conversation with the same point as a punctuation mark, to end it rather than deepen it. Stupid, pointless, menacing. That's what I thought of Christians and their God, Jesus who in paintings looked as powerful as a Breck shampoo commercial model. As a professor of English and women's studies on the track to becoming a tenured radical, I cared about morality, justice, and compassion. Fervent for the worldviews of Freud, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin, I strove to stand with the disempowered. I valued morality, and I probably could have stomached Jesus and his band of warriors if it weren't for how other cultural forces buttress the Christian right. Pat Robertson's quip from the 1992 Republican National Convention pushed me over the edge. Feminism, he sneered, encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. Indeed, the surround sound of Christian dogma commingling with Republican politics demanded my attention. After my tenure book was published, I used my post to advance the understandable allegiances of a leftist lesbian professor. My life was happy, meaningful, and full. My partner and I shared many vital interests, AIDS, activism, children's health and literacy, literacy golden retriever rescue, our Unitarian Universalist church, to name a few. Even if you believe the ghost stories promulgated by Robertson and his ilk, it was hard to argue that my partner and I were anything but good citizens and caregivers. The GLBT community values hospitality and applies it with skill, sacrifice, and integrity. I began researching the religious right and their politics of hatred against queers like me. To do this, I would need to read the one book that had, in my estimation, gotten so many people off track, the Bible. While out on the lookout for some Bible scholar to aid me in my research, I launched my first attack on the unholy trinity of Jesus, Republican politics, and the patriarchy in the form of an article in the local newspaper about promise keepers. It was 1997. 
The article generated many rejoinders, so many that I kept a Xerox box on each side of my desk, one for hate mail, one for fan mail, but one letter I received def defied my filing system. It was from the pastor of Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. It was kind and inquiring. It was a kind and inquiring letter. Ken Smith encouraged me to explore the kind of questions I admire. How did you arrive at your interpretations? How do you know you are right? Do you believe in God? Ken didn't argue with my article. Rather, he asked me to defend the presuppositions that undergirded it. I didn't know how to respond to it, so I threw it away. Later that night, I fished it out of the recycling bin and put it back on my desk, where it, started, where it stared at me for a week, confronting me with the worldview divide that demanded a response. As a postmodern intellectual, I operated from a historical materialist worldview. The Christianity is a super, supernatural worldview. Ken's letter punctuated the integrity of my research project without him knowing it. Friends with the enemy. With the letter, Ken initiated two years of bringing the church to me, a heathen. Oh, I had seen my share of Bible verses on placards at gay pride marches. The Christians who mocked me on Gay Pride Day were happy that I and everyone I loved were going to hell. It was clear as blue sky. That is not what Ken did. He did not mock. He engaged. So when his letter invited me to get together for dinner, I accepted. My motives were at the time my motives at the time were straightforward. Surely this will be good for my research. Something else happened. Ken and his wife, Floyd, and I became friends. They entered my world. They met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly about sexuality and politics. They did not act as if such conversations were polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate. When we ate together, Ken prayed in a way I'd never heard before. His prayers were intimate, vulnerable. He repented of his sin in front of me. He thanked God for all things. Ken's God was holy and firm, yet full of mercy. And because Ken and Floyd did not invite me to church, I knew it was safe to be friends. I started reading the Bible. I read the way a glutton devours. I read it many times that first year in multiple translations. At a dinner gathering my partner and I were hosting, my transgendered friend, Jay, cornered me in the kitchen. She put her large hands over mine. This Bible reading is changing you, Rosaria, she warned. With tremors, I whispered, Jay, what if that's true? What if Jesus is real and the Lord and the and the risen Lord? What if Jesus is a real and risen Lord? What if Jesus is real and a risen Lord? What if we what if we are all in trouble? Jake excelled deeply, Rosaria, she said. I was a Presbyterian minister for 15 years. I prayed that God would heal me, but he didn't. If you want, I will pray for you. I continued reading the Bible, all the while fighting the idea that it was inspired, that the Bible got the bigger inside me. But the Bible got to be bigger inside me than I. It overflowed into my world. I fought against it with all my might. Then one Sunday morning, I rose from the bed of my lesbian lover and an hour later, I sat in a pew with the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. Conspicuous with my butch haircut, I reminded myself that I came to meet God, not fit in. The image that that came in, the image that came in like waves of me and everyone I loved suffering in hell, vomited into my consciousness and gripped me in its teeth. I fought with everything I had. I did not want this. I did not ask for this. I counted the costs, and I didn't like the math on the other side of the equal sign. But God's promises rolled in like sets of waves into my world. One Lord's Day, Ken preached on John 7, 17. If anyone wills to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. This verse exposed the quicksand in which my feet were, were stuck. I was a thinker. I was paid to read books and write about them. I expected that in all areas of life, understanding came before obedience. 
And I wanted God to show me on my terms why homosexuality was a sin. I wanted to be the judge, not the one being judged. But the verse promised understanding after obedience. I wrestled with the question, did I really want to understand homosexuality from God's point of view? Or did I just want to argue with him? I prayed that night that God would give me the willingness to obey before I understood. I prayed long into the unfolding of day. When I looked in, in the mirror, I looked the same. But when I, when I looked into my heart through the lens of the Bible, I wondered, am I a lesbian? Or has this all been a case of mistaken identity? If Jesus could split the world asunder, divide marrow from soul, could he make my true identity prevail? Who am I? Who will God have me to be? Then one ordinary day, I came to Jesus, open-handed and naked. In this war of worldviews, Ken was there. Floyd was there. The church that had been praying for me for years was there. Jesus triumphed. And I was a broken mess. Conversion was a train wreck. I did not want to lose everything that I loved. But the voice of God sang a sanguine love song in the rubble of my world. I weakly, I weakly believed that if Jesus could conquer death, he could make right my world. I drank tentatively at first, then passionately of the solace of the Holy Spirit. I rested in private peace, then in community, and today in the shelter of a covenant family where one calls me wife and many call me mother. I have not forgotten the blood Jesus surrendered for this life. And my former life lurks in the edges of my heart, shiny and still like a knife. I, 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 hope, I, I hope the Christians there will appreciate. Um, I hope the Christians will appreciate if Jesus is in your life. You'll sacrifice a lot of things that you love. The Christian life isn't about having everything you want and sometimes the things that are very dear to your heart and soul. Um, one thing that really hit me in that, and, and uh, this is so minor by comparison, but it's the only analogy I can grab. I can't imagine what she's going through. But um, we have people that are like, say, anorexics, some very fine people. I may do a show on Karen Carpenter, who's an anorexic. You know, she always felt that she was fat and she wasn't. She was so skinny thin. And so when Rosario was saying that that's not me, it's just my feeling that's not me. I was thinking again of Karen Carpenter. That's, she was not fat. Fine young lady, too thin. But her mind was messing with her and saying, you're fat. And so with Rosaria, her body and flesh were wrestling with her and telling her that this is what you need. And, you know, I get that there's a biological imperative there. And like I said, heterosexuals, I tried to highlight that heterosexuals are not immune from their temptations either, starting with David Petraeus and F. Scott Fitzgerald and any number of other people. It doesn't make certain actions right just because it really hurts. And I can't imagine how painful this was for her. And um, <laughs> my only light explanation is like, okay, when I do instrument flying training, your body's telling you one thing and you know it's going to, crash you right in the ground if you cave in. And I don't know, I, I didn't mean to, it's almost insulting that I bring that up. That's just the only thing, that's the first thing that came up to my mind. So uh, you can find that article, and she's written a book. Um, I just, you know, I, I just, that's all I could say on that. I, I think this is a beautiful testimony. That's what Christianity is about. It is about bearing your cross. It's not necessarily about, you know, living happily ever after in this life. So th this, this isn't about 
me telling other people how to live their lives. This is about God saying, this is what's expected of you if you follow the Lord. It's as simple as that. And if people don't want to follow the Lord, you know, they'll follow something else. So, <clears throat> so thank you. I, I, I really did like that testimony. I really did like that testimony. And, okay, since, you know, we're talking here, and it's been long enough that I feel more comfortable talking about it. You know, 30 years ago, how long ago is it? Like, goodness, it's about 35 years ago. There's a married woman that I was, we did nothing wrong, but, you know, I was, you know, I was a music student and then became an engineering student. I went to school at George Mason and I met this woman who, uh, she could play concert level piano like me. And she's a chemical engineer, come back to, to get her master's in, in music teaching. And, you know, we didn't really go out. We, we just would bump into each other like in the, in the cafeteria. Um, she's about seven years older. And so we could talk piano and chemistry. I remember the first time a mutual friend introduced us I said, you're, so you, you studied, you're a chemical engineer. Did you study physical chemistry in college? And I didn't mean to say that, but that's notoriously the most difficult course, but it just sounded really bad. <laughs> and and the guy who introduced the two of us said, yeah, that's the best kind. I'm just like, oh yeah, that's the wrong thing to say, Sal. And um, I, I ended up, uh, you know, she was in an, unhappy marriage. She was separated. And it's like, Lord, I really like this girl. She's athletic. She has a real sweet personality, just it, kind of a clone of me in terms of kind of, you know, a sweet guy. She was a really sweet girl. And, you know, I remember walking through campus with her and she talked about one time she had a conversation about thermodynamic chemistry and she's using the word enthalpy. I said, like, just the way she said that enthalpy just hit me in the heart. And so sometimes we'd wander off into the music buildings and get on a grand piano. I would, she'd play Bach and Beethoven for me. I'd play Chopin and uh, Liszt for her. And sometimes she would sing. It would just is she's like a nightingale. And you know, it's she. She met my parents and it, you know the, thought she was wonderful. And it's like, Lord, this isn't this isn't. From, and I and I agonize. You could see that even after 35 years, it's just like still, I still remember what I feel. Now I did see her, and she wasn't a Christian on top of everything. And I saw her a couple of years after, you know, some of this. And it, it, you know, it just the allure and the glamour disappeared. I'd you know gotten interested in other things and even another woman. So. And, and and forgot, but I still, you know, after 35 years, I just remember how painful that was. I remember just saying, Lord, why'd you write a law like this? This is so hard. I mean, can't you just get divorced and she and I have a future together? I mean, I was just really wrestling with this. So, you know, I mean, um, I, I don't mean to trivialize anyone else's experience. I'm just fessing up here that I, I totally, you know, don't think that heterosexuals don't suffer under, don't suffer too. God's law is pretty hard sometimes, but Jesus said his burden is light because uh, ultimately heaven will make up for all that. That's the promise. So anyway, <clears throat> let's see what's on, else on the docket. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to wrap this up quickly because I always save the worst for last. And one reason I go into these other topics, I, you know, I, I love sharing the Bible and I tried to explain some things in the Bible because there's a lot of politics surrounding gay marriage and transgenderism and et cetera, et cetera. And I wanted to explain the Christian perspective. This is about our relationship with God. If the Christian faith is real, we're on the hook. I'm not arguing on this channel that it's going to be pleasant. 
I'm arguing that it's true. This is hand, these laws were handed by God himself to us. And this is where faith is really tested. If, if you want to dismiss my arguments from intelligent design and archaeology and history, say, um, you know, the Christian God's not real, okay. But if he is, we're all on the hook. And that's what I'm saying. And so when I make these, you know, when I say this is wrong in God's eyes, it's because of all the things that I presented here that I'm arguing that. Because it's because there is a creator, there is evidence that that creator is the Christian God and that the Christian God is testified by the scriptures. And in the scriptures are all these commandments and standards of how we are to live our lives in a way pleasing to God. So, yeah, say you're in a tough situation where you have a spouse that has all sorts of issues, like S. Scott Fitzgerald's wife, or situations like that, and someone comes along, God says, no, that's not what you're going to grab. So, <clears throat> anyway, um, and like I said, I tried to denerd the channel a little bit, uh, because it gets too much when we're talking about um, books like Abrahamowitz and Stegan, which uh, I shared yesterday where it's all math. <laughs> and I, I wanted to talk about some things that touch people's hearts and lives. And I really didn't, sh I think Rosaria Butterfield's story is the most beautiful um, because I think a lot of people who are Christians who are bearing crosses understand and those are emotional things. There are other crosses that Christians bear, um, you know, with everyday life. And um, it still was in, in, encouraging to me. So now we're going to get to the nerdy stuff. Okay, so I had here on the docket some critical thoughts about John Calvin's understanding of science and physics. This is one of the reasons, there are two reasons that there's, two or three reasons I don't like people labeling me a Calvinist. One, John Calvin said that heliocentrists are of the devil, that they have, let me see if I could actually find the quote here. It, it might be better if I quote him verbatim. And again, this is one of the reasons I have kind of my trauma with pastors and theologians. This is what Calvin had to say. He said, the Christian is not to compromise as to obscure the distinction between good and evil and is to avoid the errors of those dreamers who have a spirit of bitterness and contradiction who reprove everything and prevent the order of nature, we will see some who are so deranged, not only in religion, but also who in all things reveal their monstrous nature, that they will say that the sun does not move and that it is the earth which shifts and turns. When we see such minds, we must indeed confess that the devil possesses them and that God sets them before us as mirrors in order to keep us in fear. Um, <clears throat> um, this is really bad. Calvin is advocating geocentrism and that those who disagree with him are of the devil. And I was just like, you know, <sighs> when you're dealing with science and we're trying to gather facts, um, You know, I, for one, it's been shown factually that Calvin was wrong. And, and so with this whole old earth and young earth debate, it's like, okay, there, there might be nuances to this that we don't understand. I'll tell you, even young, a young earth creationist, Russell Humphreys, was postulating that, oh, okay, maybe the universe is really, really old and the earth is young. The time just flows really fast. That's his white hole cosmology. He got some flack from that because some on theological grounds, but I'm like, okay, 
let's say that he's wrong. Give him the space to be wrong. There might be aspects, you know, I believe the cosmos is young. But let's, you know, I'm kind of against like demonizing people. I've, I've seen this on like the answers in Genesis slide saying that, you know, the acceptance of the universe being old is, has led to all the depravity we see today. And I'm like, um, I don't think so. It might be, it might be a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. There are lots of old earth creationists that are living very fine Christian lives. Um, and that's just, you, you know, um, I see people that have their yek doctrine and end up being like Ted Haggard, who ended up having some extramarital stuff uh, with a guy and um, taking drugs, just the other hypocrisy. I just like, you know, that's, it's, it's that sort of evil heart that's the cause of depravity. I wouldn't say that a physicist or electrical engineering guy that is studying Maxwell's equations and actually doing radar research and seeing that the speed of light is constant as far as he could tell, and therefore he infers that the universe is old. I don't see that as being sinful. I think he's mistaken, and I'm trying to figure out those mistakes and help him along. I'm not going to try to deal with him by condemning him as some sort of um, root cause of all the depravity in the world. And, uh, I, that's where I draw the line. I just have to say that. And I've gotten flack for saying that, for what, what I just did. So if you want to know where I stand, I'd say he's, I believe he's mistaken, but I don't believe it goes way, way, way too far to say that this has led to all the depravity in the world. So when I said it's a necessary but not sufficient condition, it's necessary that the world be old for Darwinian evolution to be true. But then there are lots of other things you can destroy Darwinian evolution with and also abiogenesis theory. So that in and of itself, accepting that the world is old is not enough. And there are lots of old earth creationists that be believe in literal Adam and Eve. We haven't worked it out. I had an interview with Stephen Meyer that I posted on his channel. He said he thinks humanity is young, which is consistent with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So there may be other theological problems. As I said, I think the simple reading of the Bible does say young earth, young cosmos. But if there are physicists wrestling with it, and I've showed Maxwell's equations, I said, this isn't easy. Darwinian evolution fails on its own demerits if we just use accepted physics and chemistry. But it's much harder to use accepted physics and chemistry to show that the world is young. It's much harder. We might have to revise our understanding of the laws of physics. And this is going to be a much bigger deal. And so I have a lot more empathy. And I don't like, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't agree that we should, we should be trying to, to tar and call these people and suggest that they're at the cause of apostasy in the church. I don't. They're wrestling with real facts. And, you know, I'm going to, and to that end, I'm going to introduce some facts that maybe they're not aware of. So the old earth creationists, have, a lot of them have privately said, if someone could show me, I'm eager to believe. And I know that because I was in that camp and it took me suffering through graduate school and suffering through a lot of peer reviewed journals to read. And I, I'm just like, yeah, this is, I think there's a chance the young cosmos, the young earth can be true. We don't have as good a case as we do for the miracle of life, you know, versus abiogenesis. Definitely not as good a case, but we have a case. And I personally think the case is getting stronger each year. So that's where it stands. And I, so that now leads me to Roland DeWitt. Roland DeWitt. If you can falsify old earth, you could probably get rid of a lot of degeneracy. Well, logically speaking, if something is a necessary but not sufficient condition and you falsify a necessary condition, yes, um, everyone 
would have to acknowledge, if you can show empirically the world is young, that it was created. Absolutely correct. If we can be done empirically and theoretically, at least for those who are open mind, we can really we can really seal the deal. It'll it'll definitely end any question of universal common ancestry in favor of common design, common design instead of common ancestry. So to that end, let me show a little things from Roland DeWitt. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to try to grab it here. Uh, if you'll forbear with me. And let's see if they have it. And this is from the University Archive at Cornell. And let me share it. Roland DeWitt, 1991, Detection of Absolute Motion and Gravitational Waves. In the Cornell University Archive, Reginald Cahill, who's a very fine physicist in my opinion. Though some people call him a crank, I've read some of his path, it's genius. In 1991, Roland DeWitt carried out a, an experiment in Brussels in which variations in the one-way speed of RF waves, RF stands for radio frequency, uh, in the one-way speed of RF waves, through a coaxial cable were recorded over 178 days. The data from this experiment shows that DeWitt had detected absolute motion of the Earth through space and had six earlier experiments beginning with, <clears throat> as had six earlier experiments beginning with the Michelson Morley experiment of 1887. His results are in excellent agreement with the extensive data from the Miller 1925 26 detection of absolute motion using gas mode Michelson. Interferometer atop Mount Wilson, California. The DeWitt data reveals turbulence in the flow, which amounted to the, detec to the de detection of gravitational waves. Similar effects were also seen by Miller and by Tor and Colin in the, their coaxial cable experiment. Here we bring together what is known about the DeWitt experiment. And so this can be found. This is actually kind of a readable, a lot of physics papers are just borderline, un they are unreadable. This was reasonably readable. And I've actually communicated with Reg Cahill, Reginald Cahill, uh, about an inter interferometer I was building that was duplicating his experiment. So um, I had inconclusive results. But anyway, let me see. So there's Roland DeWitt. Um, let's see if I could find something here. Well, we're running out of time. Well, here it is, the DeWitt experiment. In a 1991 research project within Belgicom, the Belgian telecommunications company uh, and other serendipitous detection of absolute motion was performed. The study was undertaken by Roland DeWitt. This organization had two sets of atomic clocks in two buildings in Brussels separated by 1.5 kilometers. And the research project was an investigation of the task of synchronizing these two clusters of atomic clocks. To that end, five megahertz radio frequency radio RF signals were sent in both directions through two buried coaxial cables linking the two clusters. The atomic clocks were cesium beam atomic clocks and there were three in each cluster, A1, A2, A3 in one cluster, B1, B2, B3 in the other. In that way, the stability of the clocks could be established and monitored. One cluster was in a building on Rue de, Mar de Marais, and the second cluster was due south in a building on Rue de Pallier. Digital phase comparators were used to measure changes in times between clocks within the same cluster and also in the propagation times of RF signals. Time differences between clocks within the same cluster showed a linear phase drift caused by the clocks not having exactly the same fre frequency together with short-term and long-term noise. However, the long-term drift was very linear and reproducible and that drift could be allowed for in analyzing time differences 
in pro propagation times between the clusters. And I, I won't read all the, the details of this, but suffice to say they found the one evidence of a one-way speed of light that has relevance to young earth creationism. If, so how does this have to relate with anything we talked about as far as adultery and homosexuality? If, if we find evidence of the young earth, I think as Protract says, as far as what's right and wrong, that settles it. I mean, some people will, I, we posed that question to atheists and they've kind of dodged uh, on Mike Jane's channel, we posed that question to atheists to see how they responded. They, they didn't feel comfortable answering it. They say, well, it's kind of moot because it's old. And it's just interesting to see their response because just the possibility that there could be an empirical measurement that could throw all of their morals and what they live for in the worldview into confusion is <coughs> a big deal. So I just wanted to share that. And so now I'm going to get, we're getting near to closing time. And uh, this, this paper by Cahill, he had other papers that described experiments. And there have been amazingly a lot of rebuilds of the Michelson-Morley experiment. And if they use a dielectric rather than a vacuum, like a um, um, something that is in non-vacuum mode, like air or glass, uh, the interferometer works better in detecting the ether. So that's the claim. Now, I'm skeptical as a person, and I said, okay, I want to build one of those interferometers. Now, the Michelson interferometer is really hard to build, uh, but others have reconstructed it. Dem Demjanov in Russia, fabulous job. And he references Cahill's work. Cahill built several interferometers. I built, he built a laser interferometer and then, um, oh, he doesn't have a channel. He has a blog. Did you know that, Matt? So we'll cover some, um, some of his stuff, Mike Gene. But anyway, this, he had a laser interferometer. He described how to construct it. And I, I'm just like, well, there, there are so many interferometers he had. I said, I'll build the cheapest one. My results were inconclusive. But the first interferometer I wanted to work on, uh, I, I was saying I need to get a um, a LaCroix wave runner. And I just, how did this topic come up? I was cleaning, as I said, I'm cleaning the house. So I, I found this LaCroix wave runner. And I was checking out the specs. It can measure picosecond delays in a signal, which is amazing. I went back to my old school and talked to my old professors. I said, I'm trying to build, do we have, do you have any picosecond oscilloscopes? I'm willing to pay, pay rent or whatever. I, I just need some lab time. And I was asking around, these things run like $20,000. And then I looked at some really good oscilloscopes that could work with some of the newer experiments that Cahill is suggesting. They run in the half million dollar range. And like, no, not gonna go there right now. I need to learn more about theory, and we may talk about this on my channel and also the Evidence Reasons Academy. Um, so um, here, here, Matt, let me let me type a note to Matt. Look up the Shadow to Light WordPress blog. I hope that helps you. Mike Jean has some great posts there. Not so much on intelligent design, but commentaries on culture. So it was just kind of heartwarming to see. And I, I actually talked to Dr. Sanford about my experiments there and he, he, he was almost willing to fund it. I said, no, we're not quite at that stage yet. And um, I uh, uh, he, then he told me about Ron Hatch, whom he knew and then who also was in the GPS council with my boss uh, at MITRE Corporation. Really, it's the president. The president wouldn't even know me. We'd run into each other in the elevator. He wouldn't know me by name, Marty Fega. And um, uh, Ron Hatch is not a, uh, he doesn't believe in Einsteinian relativity. Some other four called Neil Lorenzian, 
which is also Cahill's view, and I would classify myself as neo Lorentzian too. And um, so, so, so it's like, okay, so Ron Hatch built the Hatch filter that makes GPS work. And he actually said that his construction of the filter made him start to question general relativity. I said, this is a big deal. So this is all catching my attention. So people ask me why, and they say, doesn't all physics point to the cosmos being old and I'll say maybe most of it but like a lot of things right when you think evidence for certain things in the creationist model or you know it's on its last breath it just comes back roaring so that was the case with abiogenesis and then now with organic evolution and you know maybe some things in geology and now cosmology and so how do I settle the question of homosexuality and transgenderism, this is how to settle it. The facts may speak and settle the matter and tell us there is a God and that that God is the Christian God. It may be difficult news for some people and it may be across the bear to accept the Lord. But this is, you know, I feel this is my, my mission now to find this evidence um, because right now the Yeks don't have a unified cosmology, and that's okay. We're still searching and trusting the Lord for victory in that area. And finally, um, I was going to talk about Formula One engines and dragsters just to finish out, because that has a nothing to do topic. But if you're an engineer, you're just fascinated by machines. I found out like a dragster engine. So that's just a short race. You know, they, 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 take that dragster and just run the cars down for a quarter mile. I think the world record is like 330 some miles an hour to get up from zero to 330 miles an hour in just a quarter mile is amazing. And it pushes the laws of what we can design within the rules. There are probably ways they could, they could make them real fast, like, you know, an explosion, but you know, they want to make this with car engines. And then I was watching a video on this, and I may try to put it in the video description. Um, they said, well, it's really not that expensive. I mean, it's more expensive than a, uh, you know, um, a regular automobile for, you know, that's legal for the road uh, being in the 300,000 or multi hundred thousand dollar range just for the engine. And it has to be rebuilt. Each time they do a drag race, they have to take it apart and rebuild it because I, I don't know the reasons why they said it's still more economical than a formula one engine. And I'm just like, those race cars have ex even more expensive engines. I looked it up on the internet. They're on the range of like $10 million, $10 million for a car engine. So I just thought that was, I thought that was cool. And there I've since lost the video where some guy who normally talks about military things in history this was talking about drag racing. I said, that seemed like, you know, I said, you, that YouTube algorithm that figures out what your interests are was pretty sharp. It said, gee, I think this guy has fits, you know, Sal's profile would fit someone that would be interested in learning about the engines and drag racing. <laughs> okay. So that's pretty much it for today. And tomorrow, not on this channel, I'll read Dr. Dan and I, 9 PM, will be talking on his channel about, um, some topics in evolutionary biology, phylogenetics, cladistics, um, databases, trees, uh, apomorphies, some apomorphies, whatever morphies, paleontology. And uh, that will be Death by Nerd tomorrow on his channel. I'll rebroadcast it here. Uh, it is of interest to creationists that are trying to think about uh, literal Adam and Eve and trying to reconstruct um, when Adam and Eve lived. And so we will use the same language. So uh, I think that should be uh, very informative. You'll get to see Sal as a student rather than a teacher because Dr. Dan's going to teach me. And we did invite Emery. And the channel is Creation Myths, Creation Myths channel. Creation Myths channel. Um, if someone could help put that in the chat. So I'm going to shut the stream down and 
thank you for being with me today. That's so that will be tomorrow on Dan's channel. And then on Friday night, um, tentatively, it'll be Dr. Sandy Pigeon and I talking about archaeology. And then Saturday night, um, we'll try to find some people that can help us do a, um, kind of a nice long fellowship time on Saturday night. So those are the plans. Thank you for joining us this evening. Take care and God richly bless you.